Today, I'm very honored and pleased to introduce John Dole from Raleigh, who's our speaker today. He has a BS degree from Michigan State University and a PhD from the University of Minnesota, both degrees in horticulture. After graduate school, um, John joined the faculty of Oklahoma State University from 1989 to 2000, when he then came to NC State uh, University teaching various courses in the Department of Horticultural Science. At NC State, John has been department head uh, in the Department of Horticultural Science. He's been director of the graduate programs and is currently the associate dean and director of academic programs in the university's College of Agriculture and Life Science. John's specialty is, is in the cut flower industry, and he is the co-author of a book called Floriculture, Principles and uh, Species. And he serves on several national committees involved with cut flower growers. John is here today to talk about how flowers are the backbone of horticulture and agriculture and how they have evolved over millennia, many, many years, developing different pollination strategies and how flowers are very important in today's society. So please welcome John Dole. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, Thanks to Bobby for asking. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. I enjoy talking about flowers and it's great to have the chance to do that again. And thanks to Chris for setting everything up and making it so easy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides here and get us started. So uh, what I'm gonna be talking about really is, is a floral journey. And this, this journey is gonna be uh, three journeys in one. It's gonna be part travelogue. Um, as I was thinking about it this morning, I've been to uh, pretty much every continent looking at flowers and, and floriculture, except for Antarctica. So there are no flowers viewed here or, or in the photos here from Antarctica. Uh, it'll be a science journey. I'm going to give a little bit of content. I am a teacher. So, of course, I have to get some science in there. It's sort of required by law uh, that I do so. And then it'll be a very much a photographic journey. You're going to see lots of flowers. You know, flowers just are so fun to photograph and they lend themselves to that. And so you are going to see bunches of flowers. So let me start with uh, the first slide here, which is, um, you know, we use flowers to celebrate the significant times in our lives. Uh, you know, we just had Valentine's Day last month, and this is the beautiful Valentine's Day bouquet, uh, you know, with, with roses and asters and, and chrysanthemums, just gorgeous. Um, of course, weddings. Uh, you know, there's a cute little flower girl. This was when I was in Copenhagen. I arrived a day early for a conference just so I could uh, get the jet lag cleared and was walking around town and noticed this little girl just waiting while her parents and family and stuff were, were getting all everything set for the wedding. And there was, she was just sitting right there as content as could be with the uh, with her pacifier and her flowers waiting for everything to get going. So I couldn't resist but take a photograph of her. You know, we think about flowers in our culture, but the fact is there are some other cultures that take it to a whole new level. Uh, many years ago, I had the chance to go to Pakistan. And uh, uh, here's one of the flower stalls, one of the flower markets at Pakistan, you know, with all the flowers ready to go. But um, wow, here is, they were decorating the car for a wedding. And uh, I wish I had a chance to go to a Pakistani or an Indian wedding while I was there. Um, I've seen some of the photos, and if you Google that, you'll just see spectacular uh, flowers. You know, here they have the car all decked out, ready to go. I mean, that just puts, you know, I think here in the United States, what we do, a bunch of, of um, beer cans on a string after the car. You know, that this pretty much puts us to shame. And then, of course, here were the, the individual flowers that they had uh, getting ready to make garlands out of them. Uh, some places make festivals out of flowers. I grew up in West Michigan, which has a tulip festival um, because there's a lot of Dutch that settled there and they and they will have a tulip festival every year. Probably the most spectacular festival for flowers in the world has to be this Feria de las Flores. And this is in Medellin, Colombia. Um, it is intended to model the cijateros. Uh, in, in Medellin, it's a high altitude city, but it has mountains that are higher even around it and the flowers are grown in the mountains. And the festival was developed as a way to memorialize the Sijateros, who were the ones who would pick the flowers, 
and then carry the flowers from the mountains down into the markets in, in Medellin. And it's a, the highlight of the festival is a two to three hour parade of these cijeteros carrying dis floral displays, uh, sort of like um, uh, uh, the Festival of Roses, you know, in California, except everything is carried by hand. And look at this. I mean, they use lightweight wood, but nevertheless, if any of you have ever carried a bucket of flowers, you know how heavy that is. Well, multiply that by many, many times. And so here are the, the cijeteros uh, carrying these displays. Uh, th th this one particular was for a one of the neighborhoods within Medellin. Uh, this one was talking about domestic violence. So there are some public messages. It was one of the award winners. Here's a close up of one of the displays. And you can see oh, the just gorgeous, gorgeous flower work there. Here's another one talking about the Cijateros. And of course, there cannot be a festival without a beer commercial. And so, yes, indeed, uh, here is a floral beer commercial. Um, you know, but flowers also enrich our daily lives. You know, this is one of my favorite houseplants, and this photo was taken in my house here. It's one of the jewel orchids, uh, Stenoscarcos, just one of my favorites. And in fact, it happens to be flowering again right now. I've got one in the house and one at my office, uh, just flowering away. Just love this little guy. And here's a close-up of the flowers. And then, of course, there's flowers outdoors. These are this is floral displays. Uh, perennial beds in Whistley Gardens in the United Kingdom. Uh, here's Longwood Gardens, of course, just masterful at putting together spectacular floral displays. Uh, and then there's the less dramatic, but still just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, this is from, of course, our very own J.C. Ralston Arboretum, as is this one. And this was from a hanging basket I had a few years back. Uh, just these beautiful, beautiful colors. Uh, these are from the pots in my front yard, putting together various combinations of flowers and foliage. Of course, flowers are important for us for mental health. And I originally had a bunch of different slides showing a little bit of statistics on what flowers can do for mental health. And then I came across this quote. And I thought, my gosh, this can't say it any better. Impact can last for days, proving much more powerful than a bar of chocolate. You know, you just can't say it any better than that. Um, so I'm going to let that quote stand for, for what flowers will do for our mental health. You know, we tend to think of flowers as being a luxury item, but this is not, uh, this is not, this is often not the case. I, and this slide here, I need to explain just a little bit. This is not my photograph, um, but it is a photograph that shows what I saw at the time. In the 1990s, I had the chance to go to Venezuela on a nature trip, bird watching trip, and we went way out into the edge of the, the rainforest. And there we found a slash and burn farm. And uh, we were walking around the farm and it looked very much like this. They had planted crops. You can see corn and beans, and you can see the stumps of the trees that they had cut down and burned. And within that farm, there was a shack uh, you know, a, a home where the people have, have, were living. What's fascinating about it, and unfortunately, I, I didn't have my camera with me at the time. It was before digital cameras, but um, and digital phones, by the way. Um, this family was subsistence farming, living on the very edge, poor as poor can be, and they had taken the time to do a row of solosia and gonfrina around their yard, which basically was a, a few bushes and and dirt. You know. I think that says so much about the importance of flowers, you know, when a very, very poor family takes the time to put in a row. And they had the row all the way around and the flowers just were absolutely gorgeous. So I think that says it's probably the best of, of any of my examples here. Um, but of course, we, we have to consider the fact that flowers are commercially important. Uh, that's part of my position is to work with commercial floriculture. Uh, these are cyclamen in a big greenhouse being ready for Valentine's Day. And then, of course, we have local flowers, which have become a really wonderful uh, part of the market. Uh, this is Betsy Hitt from Peregrine Farms, uh, you know, a little bit uh, west of here, selling flowers at the farmer's market in Carlborough. Uh, Carlborough. Um, and, of course, there's flowers we eat. You know, I just picked broccoli last night uh, from second crop of broccoli from the plants we put in this fall. I'm gonna be putting out the new crop of broccoli here shortly. So, you know, some of the flowers we eat directly, such as artichokes, cauliflower, 
And then of course, there's all the various types, you know, uh, violets and violas that we use for garnishes that are edible. And then of course, some of the flowers that are used for teas and such. Um, flowers, of course, lead to fruits and grains. And here we have wheat and I could have done any number of different crops here uh, showing the, the results from flowers. Um, bringing us back to some of those special products. You know, here's a cacao for, for chocolate and here is coffee. Man, can you think of what life would be without chocolate and coffee? Um, I would not want to have that. So um, let's go into a little bit of the science. I will tell you from the very beginning here, botanists love to name things. So they have names for everything. And some of these names I am sure you're gonna be familiar with. Uh, the first one here, this is the perianth. This refers to the visible parts of the flower, the most visible parts of the flower, the corolla, which uh, includes all the petals and the calyx, which includes all the sepals. Going a little bit further, we have the reproductive parts of the flower. And you can see here, we've got the stamens with the anther and the filaments. Now these are the male parts of the flower. And then of course we have the pistil, which consists of the stigma, which is the sticky end for most flowers where the pollen is lands. Then the style, which is the, the stem. Then the ovary, of course, which are the reproductive organs. And so these make up the, the various parts uh, of a flower. And this, this lily here shows them very well. Um, a lot of other flower, you know, a lot of other flowers go in different directions, okay? Uh, this flower right here, uh, this is Claria Dendon, Glory Bower. Uh, you can see the red petals here, and actually the white parts are, are the, the sepals. So some sepals, like on roses, are green, uh, but other species have taken those green sepals and made them very brightly colored to help attract pollinators. And of course, everybody knows and loves fuchsia. Fuchsia may not love North Carolina, um, but I do love fuchsias from my time up north. Uh, they're just absolutely spectacular combinations of of sepals, colored sepals here on the red, and then the purple are the petals in the middle. And then just because I love them, here is another, another fuchsia. Isn't that just gorgeous? Uh, with some flowers, the sepals are the, the most important part. Uh, this is status here. We know this as a cut flower. And the little flecks of white are the actual petals and the, the true flower within the sepal. Now, other plants take it in a little bit different direction. Um, instead of making the sepals colorful, they've made the leaves colorful. Uh, I've worked for over 30 years with poinsettias, so you know darn well I was going to sneak a few poinsettias into this presentation. And what we have here are bracts. These are colored leaves. The true flowers are in the middle here, and as befitting a botanist, they have named the flowers of Euphorbiaceae plants Cyathea. So we don't just call them flowers with poinsettia, we call them you know, Cyathea. And then we've got the red bracts. And I love poinsettias also in the fact that you can see this green leaf over here that's got some of the red coloring of the bract. And so um, we can see the transition there. And just a few more photos of poinsettias, just because I can and I love them so much. And this is one of the poinsettia hybrids, newer poinsettia hybrids, love you pink that is out. And if that looks like an enhanced photo, it is not. They are just this absolutely gorgeous uh, red and pink. Uh, other flowers, such as this coleus, uh, the leaves, you know, the, these are not bracts, these are colorful leaves and the variegation on the leaves. And then here we've, we've got an amaranthus, uh, just beautiful here, uh, Joseph's coat. Um, who needs flowers when you got those kind of leaves? So let's switch a little bit to flowers. You know, I've showed you a few flowers already and you can see the, the wide range of, of styles. You know, how did those flowers get to look the way they did? You know, why are there so many different kinds and shapes of flowers out there? And so uh, one of the big reasons for that is different pollinators. And there's, a, there's one of our pollinators, a hummingbird. This is Anna's hummingbird in uh, California. So we're gonna start with beetles. All right, beetles are, are not very sophisticated pollinators. As such, the beetle pollinated flowers tend to be very large. Uh, they tend to be mildly fragrant. Uh, they tend to have really thick petals that can handle beetles roaming around and they tend to have lots of stamens producing lots of pollen and lots of anthers. 
Beatles tend not, like I said, to be very sophisticated. So they rely sort of on the bull in the china shop theory of uh, pollination. They roam around, they get pollen on, they fly to another flower, they roam around, they cause damage, and then pollination happens. And here we've got magnolia flowers. Now, a few flowers have taken beetle pollination just a little bit further. And this is our water lily, uh, which is very cool because uh, it, uh, it is a little more sophisticated. The female flowers open up first and they're at the bottom of the flower and you can't really see it. You know, I couldn't really, you know, for some reason Longwood did not me wait, want me wading into their pond to stick a camera in the middle of their water lilies. But one of these days I'll get a water lily open up and show you the, the middle part of it. But the female flowers open up first and they are covered in a layer of solution. So what happens is the beetles fly into the flower, they get caught in the liquid, the pollen floats, away from the beetle and goes and pollinates the female part of the flower. Then the next day, the female part of the flower closes down and then the male part of it opens up, the liquid dries up and the beetle flies out, hopefully getting some new pollen from the flower that had been previously trapped in and it flies to another water lily. Is that not absolutely wonderful system for encouraging pollination? The next one here is bees. You know, we all know and love bees. Uh, many bee pollinated flowers are take it to another level, so to speak. They provide guidance and they show the bee where to go. So we've got snapdragons that are set up structurally to make sure the bee comes into this middle, goes down the center. Uh, to get the nectar, it has to go by the stamens. And if you open up a snapdragon flower, you'll see a very precise arrangement to make sure that happens. Here is Dutch iris closely related to the garden German iris, same thing. Uh, the bees land on this yellow petal, walk down underneath the other petal, get covered in pollen, uh, and of course, transfer that pollen off to the pistil. Uh, now we like flowers because of some of these markings. Uh, here are anemones, uh, and this is the bullseye pattern here, very clearly set up for bees uh, to land on these petals and then these markings, and it's nicely, uh, illustrated here with this, you know, this row of stamens, black stamens here, uh, telling the bee where to go. This is a pansy here called Whisker Series, where we have bred into it. We have colored these markings. We've added a little bit of color to them and make it a very pretty decorative uh, flower. Now, bees see things differently than we do. They see UV light. And if you go to this website down below here, you can see how flowers look to bees, which is a little bit different than how they look to us. Uh, passion flower, one of my favorites here, is just this great one pollinated by bumblebees. Uh, we can see here the stamens, the little yellow thing in the middle here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. I should, I should have asked that a bit ago. And then here's the anthers. And you can see the bumblebee doing its job very well. It has landed on this outer landing platform. You can see the pollen, the little bit of yellow pollen on the back here that is being I caught, you know, this photo is catching pollen in the in the very process of being transferred uh, to the, the pistil here. And um, yeah, just one of our wonderful, wonderful flowers. Uh, not all flowers, let me check the chat here real quick. I'm seeing a number of things. Okay, yes, yeah, some folks are telling me they can see the cursor, great. Okay, not all flowers do lines, although that is very common. Uh, we can see this foxglove here where it's got spots and where the spots coalesce, that's the marker. This is where the bee is supposed to land. Talk about making it easy. Now, there are some flowers that have taken this just to a whole new level. And you're gonna see various examples of orchids here. And this is one, um, these are called spider orchids. These are in Europe. Um, and I did not take this photo, although I desperately wished I could have seen these flowers and I hope someday to see them. Uh, what's very cool about them is that they emit the odor of an unfertilized virginal female bee. Now we're all adults here. So yes, we are going to be talking about sex here. So the, the flower emits this odor, which then goes ahead and does what you might expect. It attracts a male bee who, of course, thinks he is going to be mating with a female bee and, um, and does so, I guess, here. And pollination then ensues. 
So talk about taking it to a whole new level. All right, so I'm gonna dial it back down again here in, in terms of the R rating. And we're gonna talk a little bit here about fly pollinated flowers. And um, this is Stapelia. Uh, this is actually, loves Stapelia. This is actually one of my house plants when it flowered in the fall. And um, of course, every time I got close, the flies flew away, but I did finally get one photo here with a fly. Fly pollinator, very characteristic. They tend to have what I will euphemistically call a musty odor. Um, you can fill in the rest of that. Uh, they tend to have a brownish or a reddish brown color, which sort of looks like rotten meat. And again, you can then figure out the odor from that. Uh, this one, you think, and this is just a nice, this is a Gynura purple passion plant. This is a plant that I had as a kid. I love this plant because I love the purple foliage on it. And I grew it in my parents' back porch. And it starts off as a little bit of a cluster, and then it produces these long, viney stems. And one summer, my parents um, said, started saying, John, what, what do you have on the porch? I have a tendency to bring things in from outdoors, sometimes fruits, vegetables, sometimes insects, frogs, you know, mice, all sorts of little things that, that I caught and wanted to hang on to for a bit. And they were concerned that something had died on the back porch. And I did not know what they were talking about because at the time I had not put anything on the porch, but I finally tracked it down. Well, the foliage is pretty. Uh, here they're producing little orange flowers, which of course produce, which are fly pollinated and of course produce the scent of something rotten. So my parents uh, were right. I did have something rotten on the back porch, but I hadn't planned it. Now, some of these flowers take it to the next step. And man, I think you might have seen this photo here um, of the amorphophallus that we had in the in the um, greenhouses on campus. And here is the, just a regular photo of it. And Brian Jackson took this photo with a heat sensing camera, and you can see the middle part here. This this plant is uh, pollinated by flies, but it's not just enough for this plant to let that scent go out in the air, but it heats it up, and with the heat more of the essential oils are evaporated and it goes out in a wider area, drawing more pollinators in. And this is another photo from Brian here uh, showing that very, certain flowers were heating up more than others. And you can see with the, the bright white here, that being the, the highest temperature, 87 degrees. You know, uh, we don't think of plants as producing their own heat, but in certain cases they do. Some of our native plants do this as well. This is skunk cabbage. And this is a photo, I'm not one of mine, unfortunately, but it's the Eastern skunk cabbage. It tends to flower very early in the year. We may think of winter as a time when there's not pollinators around, but you'd be surprised there are. And this is a great strategy because this is the only flower flowering. And so it's gonna get all the attention. What it does is it produces heat, which allows the flower to burrow up through the, the the snow, and then it goes ahead and opens up and it gets all the attention because it literally is the only thing flowering at that time. Switching gears now to wasp. This is figs and this is some um, a photo of the figs in my yard. And uh, figs are very cool um, because they have a very special relationship with, uh, with wasp. Um, the female fig wasp will burrow in through this central hole here Okay, and we'll lay eggs. Now there are two, well actually three types of flowers uh, in inside of the fig. There are long female flowers, there are short female flowers, and there are male flowers. Okay, the short female flowers is where the wasp will lay its eggs. The larva hatch, they feed on the, the, the flower, the floral tissue there. Okay, and they basically uh, are sacrificed to produce a a young wasp. That wasp then goes through all its life stages. It then hatches, it gets covered in pollen, and then it goes ahead and burrows out and flies to another fig fruit flower, in which case it goes ahead then it pollinates that. Now, for those of you who have figs, do not worry. These are parthenocarpic. Ours are parthenocarpic. So you are not eating little baby wasps when you eat fresh figs from your garden. So I just want to get that in there. Um, I love figs. We have quite a few of them. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to get that across. Another orchid. Okay, this is Brassia. 
Um, it is another very specialized case. Uh, these flowers are, um, are pollinated by spider, female spider hunter wasps. Okay, so let me explain that just a little bit. Female spider hunter wasps. These are very large wasps that fly around and grab spiders. They then paralyze them and stuff them into um, a hole. They then lay an egg on that. That egg then of course hatches, uh, again, we're all adults here, hatches and eats the spiders. Well, this orchid has used that, and I don't know if you can see very clearly here, there's a couple of dots in the middle here that look very much like spider eyes. And then we've got the body of the spider here. And then if we do a little bit of, uh, of squinting, we can kind of see the legs here. So the spider hunter wasp is drawn in by the fragrance, uh, thinks it's a spider and tries to grab it. And in the process, of course, it goes ahead and pollinates this. All right, uh, the next one here, I'm going to do just, I know y'all are muted, but uh, who knows what pollinates this flower? What kind of organism pollinates this flower? Moth. Yes, very good. Classic moth pollinated plant here. Uh, it is white, it's moonflower. For those of you who grow it, it opens up in the evening and has a musty fragrance. So classic moth pollinated flower. Uh, this is another moth pollinated flower. This is called Darwin's orchid. Uh, it was first seen by Darwin, or when it was first seen by Darwin, he predicted that there would be a moth found with a very long proboscis that would pollinate this because these long, uh, the, the, these long organs here um, at the very end is nectar. And sure enough, um, this moth was found and it had a very long proboscis. And so it flies up, it unfurls its proboscis, sticks it all the way down to grab the little bit of nectar at the bottom there. And then in the process, pollinating of this orchid, if that is not cool. And this moth orchid has an 18 inch proboscis. Man, think about that, that's really long. Um, another one, this is a little closer to home here. These are yuccas from the Southwest. And of course we can grow yuccas here. Uh, the yucca moth, what it'll do is uh, it'll, Oops, getting ahead of myself here. Uh, it'll grab a bunch of pollen, roll it into a ball, and then stuff it uh, into the, the stigma here, thereby pollinating it, and then it lays an egg. Again, the plant loses a little bit of its seeds, but in turn, it gets guaranteed pollination. So very, very cool. Switching to butterflies, I think when we think of pollinators, we tend to think of butterflies a lot. Um, this photo, these photos here show two different styles uh, of classic butterfly pollinated flowers. The first is the zinnia, and this is giant cloudless sulfur on it. Uh, it has a landing platform of petals and then lots of small flowers in the middle. Um, this is to encourage the butterfly to stay on the flower for a number of time as it goes flower by flower looking for nectar. Uh, it then increases the likelihood of pollination. Other flowers do not have that landing platform and they tend to be pollinated by smaller butterflies. Uh, and we can see this for Bina benariensis, just lots of little flowers. And we got a gray hair streak here that's one by one going through those flowers. Now butterfly milkweed is well named. Um, it is absolutely loved by butterflies. And we can see this here. This is actually a photo I took in Michigan, um, just covered in hair streaks. I wanna bring your attention to an individual flower. We can see this butterfly milkweed flower here and um, the, it's got the petals that hang down and it's got the petals that are upright, okay? And so the, uh, uh, what happens, you can see the leg here, hopefully you can see the leg here of this butterfly is in between. Well, butterfly milkweed clusters its pollen together into packets and those packets are, are attached to a hook. And so then when the, leg of the butterfly goes in between these two structures, it grabs onto a hook, it grabs onto a packet of pollen, and then that is carried to the next flower. So it's not enough for the milkweed to ensure that the butterfly gets pollen on it, but it wants enough pollen to really get good seed set. And I know this works um, because I have butterfly milkweed in my yard and every year I get good large pods filled with seeds which are in some ways just as pretty as the flowers. All right, the next one here, another question time. Who, poll what pollinates these flowers?
Come on, I, all, I know you all know this. Hummingbirds. Hummingbird, yes, classic. Classic hummingbird flower uh, in, the, in North America anyway. Uh, red or orange, long tubular flowers uh, where the hummingbird can fly in with his long bill and then stick out its even longer tongue, uh, get the nectar and of course pollinate. And where any hummingbirds should be back anytime now. And if you look for them, uh, you will often see uh, them with a little bit of yellow right on the top of their forehead, and that's the pollen. Uh, if we go further south in the Americas, we will find other flowers that are not yellow, but are hummingbird pollinated, or excuse me, not red, but are hummingbird pollinated, uh, such as this ginger on the left and this heliconia on the right. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is flower in my yard. Uh, this is, of course, Brugmansia, and it is tends to be moth pollinated. It opens up in the evening. Uh, it tends to be um, uh, fragrant in the evening, so it's mainly moth pollinated, but uh, there are there is a hummingbird that will pollinate it as well. And this photo was taken by a friend of mine. We both saw this hummingbird when we were in Ecuador. Um, the sword-billed hummingbird. Look at the look at the bill on that thing. It is so it is so long that the hummingbird flies as an angle, and it's just the cool. It's sort of like one of those military aircraft. It flies along, it flies under the flower, and then zip goes right up into it um, with that long bill and long long tongue, and goes ahead and get nectar. Just the coolest thing. Um, they are they are not common, but not rare. So if you go to Ecuador, there's a chance you might actually see them. Hummingbirds are limited to the Americas, but other parts of the world do have birds, such as the sunbirds, that do pollinate flowers and are focused primarily on nectar. All right, so um, quiz question, who pollinates this? This is a tough one, isn't it? I gave you two easy ones. Now there's a tougher one. Ains. Pardon? Bats. Bats, oh, y'all are so good. Very good, very good. Yes, indeed, bat pollinated. Uh, this is a classic bat pollinated flower. Bats are sort of like bees. They're not terribly sophisticated pollinators. And so we've got a row of very thick petals that can tolerate being latched onto by bat claws. And then we've got a lot of stamens here that just are gonna cover that bat nose with pollen. And then here we've got the pistil. Uh, this, this shows, um, this is actually old man cactus. Uh, the, the photo in the background is one in my yard. And here's a photo we took in Oaxaca in Mexico of one of the cactus in the wild, which is really fun to see. And then here we have a bat coming into Sahuaro. This is of course not my photo. And you can see the classic bat pollinated and those claws there. You know, it latches onto that flower, sticks its face into it, and then goes ahead and pollinates it. Um, I, you know, not all, uh, mammals, mammal pollinators are bats. I was hiking in Western Australia a few years back and I saw this banksia and I thought, man, this does not look like a regular pollination. And I looked it up online later on and sure enough, uh, this is pollinated by a little mammal, a uh, beautiful little flower, by the way. Um, actually it wasn't that little, it was about four inches tall. It's uh, pollinated by honey possums, cutest little thing here. And of course this photo isn't mine, but it's, they're showing them perched on a, another banksia going ahead and doing its job. All right, what's the pollination strategy for this one? Wind. Yes, all right, we've got the tassels producing the pollen which land on the silk, which of course then makes it the corn that we eat. Um, similar strategy here for the water. This is called, uh, this is called a coontail. Um, it's a water plant, it releases pollen. Here's the photos in the corner here. It releases pollen into the water, which then drifts over to the flowers in through the water and pollinates them. So just like wind, but in the, in the water. Not too many plants do this, as you might expect. So I'm gonna switch gears here. And we're gonna talk a little bit about plant breeding, so to speak. Um, this is, this talks about the fact that flowers when they, when they get pollinated for some flowers, it's not enough that they get pollinated, but they wanna get pollinated with pollen from other flowers, not their own, in particular from other plants. And they have various strategies that do this. This encourages cross pollination. This encourages mixing of genes. This increases the likelihood that a novel combination of genes will be produced that will make the plant a little bit better adapted. 
So some plants go out of their way to encourage cross-pollination. And they do this through different strategies. And I told you, botanists love to name things. And so here we've got Herkomeny, Dichogamy, Dioecious, and Monoecious. The first one here is spatial separation of stamens and pistils. This is a flower here called Blakia. And here we've got the pistil down below and the orange part there up top are the stamens. Temporal separation, I'll talk about that one in just a minute. And then Dioecious and Monoecious. Dioecious, of course, is where um, the flowers on two different plants and Monoecious is where we have male and female flowers on the same plant, such as these cucumber flowers down here on the right. Uh, this photo of the of hibiscus shows the spatial separation. Uh, here is the pistil at the end here, and then here we've got the stamens. Uh, the same thing, here's a close-up of Blakia, just gorgeous native shrub and small tree from Central and South America. Uh, we can see the, the stamens here arrayed in this half moon shape up there, and then the pistil down below. Uh, this photo here is actually from um, the uh, Northwest. These are cut callas. Uh, this one has a little bit, this is the thyme. Uh, the female flowers, if you tear one of these apart, you will find the, the whole stem of flowers in the middle. At the very bottom are the female flowers, and they will open up first, and then they close up uh, when the when the upper flowers, which are male, open up. So they separate it out into time to make sure that the pollen from, from each individual male flower cannot pollinate the, the female flowers of that same flower. Now, when we talk about dioecious plants, this has a very practical horticultural implication for us uh, because in this case, this is ilex. Uh, this is grown for its decorative stems. Um, and we can see a whole whole bunch of these stems. This is a photo from the Netherlands. And what this means is that the female flowers which produce the berries are on one plant and the male is on another plant. Well, that means to grow and get fruiting on the female plants, you have to have the male plants. And so this photo here shows a field after it was harvested. The empty spots were the, were, were the plants with berries were cut. And then they, of course, they leave the male plants uh, that went ahead and did the pollination. Uh, so they have to have the male plants to get the fruit on the female. Now, some plants take it in a completely different direction. Uh, they, they, they don't necessarily want cross-pollination, but they want to just make sure that every year they get a set of seeds. And so they do self-pollination. Some flowers do it automatically, which means they've kind of given up on cross-pollination. Others do it as a backup plan. They will self-pollinate if um, cross-pollination does not work. So think about that. Some of them do it automatically and some do it in case cross-pollination does not work. So sort of the insurance policy. And there's a couple of notable crops where we have a lot of cross, or excuse me, self-pollination peanuts, for example, um, less than 1% of the flowers typically are pollinated and, we, and so forth. If you look on a peanut plant, it's actually kind of hard to find the flowers. They've gotten, they're, you know, they're, gotten so tiny because they're no longer necessary to attract pollinators, they've sort of disappeared. Uh, soybeans are also predominantly uh, self-pollinated, but if they are cross-pollinated, they will actually get a little better seed set. Now, you don't have to go to a big field or a crop to find a plant with this, but you only have to go in your backyard and they're flowering right now. So I tell everybody after my talk, go into your yard and look around. You might find a common blue violet and if you want, in later in the season, um, after the flowers have formed a little bit more, more of the flowers have formed, dig one of those plants up. Since they are kind of are a weed, you may want to be digging them up anyway. What you're going to find are two types of flowers. The chasmogamous flowers are the regular purple flowers right here. Okay, that's what we're seeing right now in our yards. But if you dig a, a violet plant up, you're going to find these strange little white structures here. These are cleistogamous flowers. They do not open up. Uh, they will, they stay cl closed, they self-pollinate it. Late in the year, later in the year, they will come up above ground, they will open up, the pod will open up and re release seeds. So fascinating plant that's right in your very own yard now. And so I would encourage you to go out right after this talk and check them out. So again, 
these clythogamous flowers that are underground and uh, will open up later. All right, so there's the science. Now we're gonna do just a little bit on the on some photos, and I call this just variations on a theme. Uh, this photo is from a um, is from a Dutch flower show. I thought they just did a spectacular job, and that's a good way to lead in. Uh, we, of course, we we have our tulips here. Um, one of the most you know simple flowers in a lot of ways, but just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, here, the petals and the sepals are the same color, so we call them uh, tepals. Uh, here's some, um, this is from, uh, from, boy, where is that? Could be the J.C. Ralston. In some cases, the petals have taken on different shapes. You know, the tulips have very classic petals. Uh, this is a kufia, which these little uh, sail-like shapes. Uh, here we have a plant from Australia known as fringe lily. Isn't that just gorgeous? Little tiny thing, but just about the size of a quarter or a half dollar, but just absolutely gorgeous. And then we have the flowers, my gosh, the flowers of, um, uh, of um, oh, I'm blanking on the, uh, um, golly, Can somebody help me here, pitcher plant. Saracenia. Saracenia, I'm having a senior moment here. The flowers are elaborate. Uh, you know, the pictures are fascinating because of what, you know, being a carnivorous plant, but look at these flowers with the sepals and the petals. Um, bleeding heart coming up. I'm sure folks probably got that starting to flower soon, if not already. Um, here's the sepals are pink and the petals are white. Okay. Uh, here we've got uh, the petals where just it forms a, a, a bell. Uh, some flowers such as the love lies bleedings, the flowers have gotten very, very tiny, but so many of them that they make up for the tininess by just thousands of little flowers. I'm gonna take the next few slides just to show orchids. I've mentioned orchids already, but orchids are the biggest plant family and have really taken this whole flower structure thing to just the nth degree. Um, so just appreciate here these absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous orchids and all the various strategies. And some of these look like insects and you can imagine some of the insects that might be doing it, uh, the pollination here as we flip through them. Here we have ladies tresses, one of our native orchids. Um, here we have one of the orchids in the mountains. Okay, uh, the showy orchis. Okay, this was taken in Western North Carolina. Here's our, just our most fascinating, beautiful lady slipper. This is not a lady slipper orchid from my yard, um, but it is uh, growing up. I had a lady slipper orchid from my neighbor, gave me a start from her orchid that she had in her yard and I had in my yard. This was probably my most a uh, significant plant in my yard. I just absolutely loved it. Uh, the pea family plants, spectacular as well. Just a few of those, uh, you know, various lupins. Here we've got wisteria. Now some flowers have, you know, sort of the de-emphasize the petal and they focus more on the stamens, such as this like chorus. Here's uh, tibicina. Uh, okay, here we have glory bush here, or needle flower. Uh, then we have um, bottle or button bush, which for those of you that love to attract pollinators, this is just absolutely great. Works very well for butterflies. Um, uh, Cephalanthus, which is, uh, we've got one in our yard. The protea family plants have taken this whole flower structure thing to an nth degree. I think they're as elaborate as the orchids. And here we've got some different ones there. Um, getting close to wrapping up colors. Remember when we were growing up, Roy G. Biv, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Well, here we've got another passion flower showing the red, one of our native plants here, the absolutely gorgeous cardinal flower. Uh, here's a tigridis or a tigridia, Mexican shell flower. Okay, here we've got African tulip tree. Uh, green, green has become so popular in cut flowers. This is um, uh, the green zinnia. Uh, ben uh, Benari giant lime, blue, not that common of a color. Mechanopsis here, took this up in Alaska. Uh, here is also in Alaska, gentiana, gentian. Is that not the most gorgeous blue? Here we've got purple from prairie gay feather, liatris. Uh, it's one of the more unusual flowers and that tends to open up from the top downward. Most flowers tend to open up from the bottom up. Of course, iris, 
Uh, brown, brown. We do have a few brown flowers. Uh, this is foxglove, one of the species foxgloves. Uh, brown is actually, this lusianthus, which is one of our native flowers, is a, typically a blue or purple flower, but breeders have pulled out brown out of it. Is this, and it's called wondrous light brown. Isn't that just a gorgeous thing? Here's a succulent milkweed from, uh, from Kenya. Now we're getting to almost black. It's so dark purple there, it's almost black. Uh, here is one called scabiosa. Uh, again, we're getting close to black here. And Xantodesia odessa, close to black. And this was what I got. I think it was for my 50th birthday, mums dyed black. All right. And since we're talking about dyed flowers, of course, anything that's not in nature can be found through dyeing. And petal shapes and numbers. I just couldn't resist putting in a few of these. This is osteospermum with its spoon-shaped petals. And then we'll go back to dahlias. My backdrop is dahlias, and they show um, something that's very cool. Um, dahlias are a composite, so they've got the normal uh, disc florets in the middle and the ray florets with the long petals. Um, but some of the cultivars have produced where the disc florets are longer. And now we've got even longer disc florets producing a type of flower called anemone. And then we've got these decorative types here where all of the petals are as long as each other. Some of these petals are twisted. Some of these petals are twirled under. Um, and then we've got roses, singles, doubles, and then just multiple, multiple kinds of doubles. So there's different ways that we can do variations on a theme. And here is my last slide that shows me that yes, it is time to end my talk. Um, thank you for your, your time and thank you for your attention. Um, it looks like it's warming up a little bit outside. So my guess some of you are probably wanting to go ahead and go outside. Um, I don't know if there is time for questions or comments, um, but I'd love to answer any if there is time. Thank you. That was a that was a great ending, John. I like the clock. <laughs> that was pretty funny. I was in a I was in a private conversation with the chat with someone uh, answering something, so I, I missed the even comment about it. But I think they asked about a website with the flower colors, what the bees see. Did you mention something about that? Yeah, it uh, unfortunately was in fairly small print at the bottom of one of the slides. I think if you just Google. Uh, UV light with bees and pollination, it'll probably pull it up. Um, it's a website that shows, uh, it for each flower, it'll show a normal photo the way we see it, and then it'll show a photo with UV light, which will show the way a bee looks at it. And what's really cool is because a lot of flowers will look one color to us, but yet um, the bee will see many markings. They see a lot more pattern in the flowers. Mm -hmm with the UV light. And those patterns are all geared towards directing, you know, it's basically an, an airport runway. Where do you go? Where do you go? Go here, go here, go here. So very cool. Uh, just go ahead and Google that and I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, and if not, anybody can email me and I'll send them a link to the, to the website. Great, thank you. And um, Amy's just asked, uh, did you say that the orchid is the biggest plant family? Yes, uh, has the most species. I see in there the biggest flower. Uh, that is the raf, raf. I'm not saying it right. Rafsia. That's that saprophytic flower in the in I think it's Malaysia. Uh, mm -hmm. It structurally it is golly, it's several feet across. Mm -hmm. um, so f folks may know a little bit more about that than I do. Um, but if you go online, um, just just spectacular. I would dearly love. To, that would be on my bucket list to see one of those. Rafflesia. What was that again? Rafflesia. Rafflesia. Okay, thank you so much. I figured somebody would know it. Other Mar questions? Marilyn just asked if if ants are also pollinators or do they distribute distribute the seeds? They're, um, that's a good question. They might very well be pollinators. I am not aware of any plants that are specifically ant pollinated. Uh, they do tend to be more involved in the seed dispersal. Um, but that's a good question. I'll need to look that up and find if there are any um, plants that are ant pollinated. I, I don't know of any off the top of my head. 
So yeah, okay. paintings always have ants on them. They're getting mm -hmm. those little bits of, of exudate, sweet exudate on them. Um, and you'll find, you know, if when I lived in Oklahoma where we had peonies there, we had more of that exudate because we had less rain. Acerum, oh yeah, that's a great one. That is fly pollinated as well. And in fact, on a longer version of this talk, oh, somebody just put in a, I love, I love Google. I love the internet. They just put in examples of ant pollinated plants in North America. I think I need to add another category to my list. <laughs> Y'all are so good. Thank you. Johnny has um, just uh, uh, retyped in his question. I forgot about it earlier. He was wondering about the hummingbird name that you mentioned from Ecuador. A sword build hummingbird. Thank you. It will come to feeders for those who are a little more adventurous. Um, it's if you, you know, Quito is where most folks land. And then it's a high altitude hummingbird. And so it's, there's places to see it within an hour of Quito. And it is just pretty darn cool. Mm -hmm. Val just asked, do the Amorphophallus flower the following year if no seed was set? Good question. Um, Amorphophallus flower generally in relation to the size of the tuber. The flowering process uses up a lot of the photosynthates in the tuber. And it's true that if they don't pollinate and they don't have seeds, then um, they probably would flower more quickly because the tuber could then regain, uh, regain mass until it's big enough to flower again. Uh, that's one of the criteria. There's various other criteria that, that dictate when a plant will flower, and that is one of them. Um, how do plants make heat? It has to do with respiration process. Um, it, um, oh golly, um, trying to think of an easy way to, to do it or to talk about it. Um, yeah, it's sort of like, you know, the, I, I go to the Krebs cycle, but nobody, I mean, not sure folks know what the Krebs cycle is. Um, anyway, I'm gonna pass on that one um, because I'm blanking on how to say it very easily. Um, have you read the Darwin's Orchid book? I have not. So there's a whole book on there. I would have to check that out. Uh, Shannon Curry, some flowers change color when pollinated. Uh, is this common? It is not very common. Uh, it is very cool, uh, but it is, is not very common for that to occur. Um, we have a number of flowers that change color as they senesce. Okay, the pigment tends to break down. Um, and of course, senescence occurs faster with many flowers after they're pollinated. Um, but it's it's more it's less common that the flower color changes specifically when they're pollinated. So yeah, that's a fun question as well. Hellebores mm -hmm. change color. Color good, good. Oh, somebody put thank you for putting the website in there. And yes, that's the one. Uh, with my screen set up, it's not as easy for me to get to chat. <laughs> I've still got screen share here. Oh, I suppose I could stop sharing the screen. If I had thought about that a little bit more. Ah, I can see my chat a little better now. <laughs> I think with all the Zoom talks, I would have done that a little more quickly. <laughs> You're probably a pro, John. <laughs> well, thank you all again. Um, I appreciate so many of you being here. Um, it's just been a lot of fun. As you can tell, I love doing this. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be here this morning. Thank you, John. That was a great start to a weekend. Thanks, John, for a wonderful talk. I think everybody really, really enjoyed that. And someone said you really made education fun and <laughs> quite a compliment. It is. It very much is. Thank you.